Hi, this is Cuba Pete with No Laughing Matter. As you can see, I have no guests. And that's because this isn't a show. We're bringing back, as we open the vault and dive into our archives, some of the spectacular shows that we've had. Interviews with fascinating individuals, with wonderful stories, and even more incredible messages. Enjoy them again. Welcome to No Laughing Matter with Cuba Pete, a show that takes a critical look at the disparities between medical school education and society's growing health care inequities. Join Dr. Pedro Cuba Pete Greer each episode as he interviews the experts working to transform medical education and ensuring that future doctors are trained to provide equitable and compassionate health care for all communities. Dr. Greer received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2009, honoring his dedication to providing health care to underserved populations. As Dean of Roseman University College of Medicine in Las Vegas, Dr. Greer is committed to creating a medical school of the future where students embrace the need to unite the heart and science of health care. And now, the host of No Laughing Matter with Cuba Pete. Dr. Pedro Cuba Pete Greer. Live from Studio A in Las Vegas. Hi, this is Cuba Pete, No Laughing Matter. I'm Pedro Joe Greer, and I'm the, the dean at the uh, Roseman University College of Medicine. And the idea of the show is to see the interaction of society and medicine and medical education and what we can do to change it. Well, today's guest is somebody who I had the utmost admiration for and had read a few of his books before I came out here. But then I saw him on PBS. And then I, I got the guts up to invite him to lunch one day. This is truly one of the most brilliant, caring professors I have ever met in my life. It is Michael Green. He's an associate professor of history at UNLV's Department of History. He obtained his undergraduate and his master's degree at UNLV and his PhD at Columbia. Today he teaches at UNLV as well as teaching us all when he's on these programs. Uh, 19th century American, Nevada, and Las Vegas for the history department and for the Honors College. The number of books that he has written are long. I'm not just going to name a few because I found them fascinating. I also learned from his writings how Lincoln treated the Native Americans, which was not very good. You know, the, those are not stories you hear about in the South. Actually, in the South, they don't talk about Lincoln at all. I've, I've heard that <laughs> that that was, he published. Power, Lincoln and his party during the Civil War, Politics in America in a Crisis, The Coming of the Civil War, Lincoln in the Election of 1860, Las Vegas, A Sentinel History. He wrote this with Eugene Morix in 2005. Nevada, which I recommend to everybody, A Journey of Discovery, which is a, a middle uh, school textbook. But the one I was referring to, actually, I, I had trouble with the middle school textbook, so I had to go to the bigger one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nevada, History of the Silver State. He is, has worked aggressively with history of organized crime. And he's, are you working on a book on that now in the I 20th century, indeed, aren't you? Yeah. Yes. And uh, also the one on the history of the Great Basin, your work. Having said all that, he is also uh, at the University of Nevada Press. He edits the Wilbur S. Shepherson series on Nevada history and is on their editorial board. But the coolest board he's on is on the Mod Museum. That is the coolest, no question. And uh, he's also... The director of, is a director for Preserve Nevada and the executive director of the Pacific Coast branch of the American Historical Association. I'd like to welcome you all to meet Dr. Professor Michael Green, who has taught me more about this state and actually so many things in the world just listening to him. And I'd like to start off, first of all, how did you get to Las Vegas? Well, first I wanna thank you. Uh, you okay. were very kind, too kind. And I've learned a lot from you. I want to be sure I mention <laughs> that. Uh, 
I like to say that my family was run out of Los Angeles on a rail, <laughs> but uh, it, it's a little more complicated. I was two years old when my family moved here, and my grandparents had retired here, and my mother didn't like the big city. Las Vegas then had a population of about 100,000. <laughs> And um, she, she wanted to be closer to mom and dad, so she said to my dad, you're going to get a job as a casino dealer. He was working at IBM, coming home each night with work and a headache. And he got a job as a casino dealer, and he came home each night with a headache, but he didn't bring work with him. And uh, for those who've seen the movie Casino, uh, the guy Robert De Niro played fired him from his uh, dealing job. And my dad was not involved in the bombing. <laughs> at just all. want to get that across. We just want that innocence out I there. I got to get that out there. Okay. So that, that's amazing. But I, I think from a medical education perspective, mm -hmm. when we take care of individuals as well as populations, mm -hmm. history becomes so important. And the history of Las Vegas, since we're going to be in the communities, is vitally important. I'm surprised sometimes when I'm talking to my peers, because one of the places we're very involved in is the West Side. Mm-hmm and ha have no idea of the history of the West Side, why it's called the West Side, and the fact that they had riots there. I think it was 1970 or 69. Around then. Around, Around then. then. And all the things that had happened here, including the history of the Moulin Rouge, which lasted a incredible six months or something of that <laughs> yeah. nature. <laughs> but, Pretty much. Uh, how important do you think it is to take care of a society that you don't understand their history? Well, I don't think you can. And let's consider West Las Vegas. Here is an area where African Americans were forced, starting in the 30s and into the 40s, it was happening before, but especially then. No running water, no paved roads, no phone service for a long time. And it took a while to develop a large enough population to have a leadership class. You had the workers, and they were working hard. But you need people who have the political background, the educational background, to be able to go in and negotiate and organize. And you see that in the 50s and 60s, as you do nationally. So our civil rights movement here is kind of a microcosm of what goes on nationally. But think about the history of things like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Which and, went on for a couple of decades, by the way. Absolutely. And the number of times an African-American, and it's not only African-Americans, mm -hmm. but certainly for, the, for this case, could not get proper medical care and could not find a doctor to trust. And it is a lot easier to trust a doctor who understands you and where you're coming from. And perhaps a doctor that looks like you. It doesn't hurt at all. And, you know, within the profession of medicine, and particularly academic medicine, which can very many times, as we've discussed, be a very toxic environment, mm -hmm. the, uh, we're also, the numbers show it. We're racist, we're sexist, we're xenophobic, and we're elitist. And we have to change that in our profession. We're supposed to be a profession of serving. But you can't serve people unless you understand their history. And, and that... And, and being Cuban-American is very interesting because the history is divided by generations. Oh, very much so. And, you know, my generation of Cubans will tell you everything, that we, we came here with nothing. Well, we were three years old. There's not three-year-olds that have a whole <laughs> lot of anything. But the, uh, it was our parents that lost things. But it was this country that gave us the opportunity. But that experience versus the experience of somebody who's now lived for 45 years in a communist country and finally comes out is very different experience, even though we're the same culture. Well, and you, you find it, for example, in Las Vegas, the sheer number of people who have migrated here, all races, creeds, you name it. But I said the population was 100,000 in 1967, mm -hmm. and now we're well over two and a half million. It's pushing toward three million. And also one of the things my wife and I love about Las Vegas is the diversity. And this is something that growing up, I was not conscious of how lacking in diversity Las Vegas was until I go to grad school in New York City, an incredibly diverse city. But around that time, you have the growth going on here that attracts a diverse community. And I have some friends who work in the area of food history. Oh, really? And I have a colleague at UNLV who did a history of Thai restaurants explaining the development of 
Thai culture, mainly in California in this case. And, and uh, as I hear it, the best Thai restaurant in North America happens to be in Las Vegas. That's the rumor. And guess what food my wife and I are getting tonight. But, <laughs> but, the thing is, I look back and we had a few Chinese restaurants when I was a kid. We did not have the diversity of food. And that is a good way to judge or measure yes. a community's diversity, frankly. 100%. Yeah. Not and, to mention it's a good way to do research. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and the other thing here, uh, I see this not only as a diverse place, mm -hmm. but even at different socioeconomic levels, you have a lot of diversity in there. Where I come from the South, where you don't see that diversity in, in different uh, communities. No. And I tell this, a story, and it's sometimes easiest to go with the anecdote. Uh, I grew up in the area now called East Las Vegas, which we called Las Vegas. <laughs> There was West Las Vegas, there was Las Vegas, okay. And, and today we, we, we kind of have to distinguish. And in the 25 years we lived there, it became predominantly Hispanic. Right. Fine. Except the time came where I wanted to move. Uh, my mother had died and my father and I were living together. And I wanted to move to have a bigger house. That was the, the reason. And we moved to another part of town. And there are 10 houses on the block. And one day, one of the neighbors yelled down at me, and uh, pointed at two houses, and he said, 10% of the population, 20% of the neighborhood. He was re referring to the two black families on the block. And I just glared at him. And I think he figured out I was glaring at him. <laughs> and later for New Year's Eve, those two families were invited to his house, and we weren't, which <laughs> I, I think shows progress. But it, this was a more socioeconomically advanced neighborhood. I could barely afford to be there, but all right but uh, bigger houses and all that. And so you have families who could afford to live in more upscale areas moving to the upscale areas. And one of the things that we, we experienced in the South during desegregation, mm -hmm. and I want you to know, I, I went to the University of Florida and in 73 was the second year they had desegregated the Southeastern Conference. And uh, it's, the, these are sad oh, yeah. commentaries. Oh yes. And, and it was funny, my name is Pedro Jose Greer. Whoever was assigning rooms assumed I was black because my name was Greer, but had never heard of Pedro Jose. So I was actually put in the black half of the dorms. And my roommate, who was the largest human being ever from the state of Georgia, Charlie Horst <laughs> Johnson, who ended up playing, I think, with Detroit in the mid-70s. This was my introduction to college. This huge man opening the door, looking down at me, going, Shoot, that's without the O's. Yeah. I thought you'd be black. And I said, it's worse than you think. I said, I'm Cuban. We look like them, but we dance like you. And so I use that at a commencement at the University of Florida to say my two most important lessons came when I was 18. If they're really big, become their friend. It's self-preservation. It's good, yeah. And number two, as we celebrate our differences, why don't we look for what we have in common, which Absolutely. greatly outweighs the differences we have. But from a medical perspective and the students, I, I call it being culturally hu humble mm -hmm. because unless you understand a person's history and their culture, you can't properly treat them or even speak with them or ask them questions. And it becomes something that we're missing in medical education is history. I think it's true. And mind you, the first day of class when I'm teaching a survey, I'm teaching a history 100, as we call it. So it's 150 students who are there to satisfy a requirement. There is no interest in history. And the first day, I will say, uh, now, history doesn't matter, right? That's what you're thinking. I'm here to satisfy a requirement. Do we have any medical professional here? Anyone who's going to go into medicine? And a couple of hands go up, and I walk over to the closest one. I say, so what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to be a nurse. And I said, oh, <coughs> I'm sick. Talk to me. She said, well, what are your symptoms? And I told her, and she said, when did they start? I went, history. You just asked history. And if you don't think like a historian, when you are in medicine, you are going to miss things. That, it, it was interesting because you're 100% correct. And the way I would do it with my histories was I'd always ask, why did you come to the office today? Well, 10 years ago, I no, no, no. Why did you come today? And then you work <laughs> your way back through history and see how that all fits in. Because that's where you really get the symptoms. And not only that, it makes you a better physician. Because the fact that you can treat somebody as a fellow human being without this power differential going on, mm -hmm. 
you're going to get a much better history and the person's going to feel a lot better because you've made them feel good, not just physically, but emotionally and all the ways that you do with that. And mind you, I mean, I'm a history professor. I'm not a I'm not a doctor. I, You're a I, real doctor. I, no, I'm, I'm an unreal doctor. I mean, I, I can't even write a prescription. It doesn't do me any good. <laughs> but uh, in teaching a class, I try not to be, if you've seen the movie The Paper Chase or oh, the yes. TV series, I, I'm not a Kingsfield, and I can't be. And I want them to be comfortable. In you the want them to learn. And that's the easiest way to learn. And if you're terrorized, in my opinion, you're not going to learn. Which is one of the great things that in academics you have and we don't in medicine. We don't train doctors how to teach. No Laughing Matter with Cuba Pete is sponsored by Roseman University College of Medicine in Las Vegas. We're transforming education by reimagining healthcare and committing to serving the health needs of all communities. And by our generous sponsors listed in the description of this episode. And yet we sometimes suffer yes. from not properly training people to teach history or other subjects. And it's so important. And my graduate advisor, and you mentioned my going to Columbia, uh, between us, he and I have won one Pulitzer Prize. Wow, He really? won it. Yeah, he won it. <laughs> uh, but he was getting ready to retire. And he has this endowed chair, and he's won all these prizes and awards, and he's written far more than I have and far more important stuff than I have. And for his final Civil War course, he had them film it. And he said, I have reached more people in teaching than I have with what I've written. And I know that. And I'd kind of like this to survive me. And you can, he's still with us, but you can go on YouTube and you look up Eric Foner, Civil War, and they called them, I think it was like massive open online courses, they called mm -hmm. them MOOCs, which always sounded like something Lenny Briscoe would say on <laughs> Law and Order, we're gonna arrest the MOOC. You know? <laughs> but you, you can go to that, and he's lecturing on the Civil War. Well, yeah, we, our teaching is incredibly important, and we don't always emphasize it enough. And you know, you, with medicine, it's often referred to as bedside manner. Which is, very interesting because in uh, medical school now, and almost I think 100% of the American medical schools, we have a course we teach called motivational interviewing. Mm. And basically it's how do you talk to somebody? Yeah. So we're, we're, one of my concerns with what we're bringing into the medical profession, it's all quantitative. Uh -huh. We're not bringing in any of the qualitative aspects that are becoming so important that we need. Uh, and that's why we lack those virtues of humility, empathy, and compassion. The other reason, I think, is because undergraduate education nowadays, mm -hmm. you can be a pure science major, mm -hmm. not take a liberal arts. But liberal arts is what teaches you to be a critical thinker and a creative thinker, which is so essential right now in healthcare because it's moving so quickly and changing. And you have to have that nimble mind to be able to do that. I would rather have a liberal arts major than a chemistry or biology major coming into med school. Believe me, we're going to teach you science. Mm-hmm. And the question now, with all the technology we have, how much basic science do, do we need to teach? And I, I will echo that. I went to Rancho High School here. And Rancho was at the edge of Las Vegas and North Las Vegas. And we were considered the poor kids' school back then. Mm -hmm. And there was a counselor who had retired and had left to another counselor her poster, which said something like, we need more doctors who are poets philosophers, engineers, historians, and so on. And I did not get as diverse an education as I wish I had. I wish I had taken more literature, more science. I, I took what I needed to take and, uh, and a couple of extras mm -hmm. here and there. But the well-rounded education is going to do more for you in whatever you choose to do. 100%. When, um, both of my kids, my, my wife is a... Uh... Uh, museumologist. She has her <laughs> master's degree in museum management and uh, with art history. Both of my kids were philosophy majors. I remember sitting at dinner with them when they were both in college going, these are the most fascinating dinner conversations. You'll never be employed. <laughs> 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 but your conversation is great. My daughter ended up going to an Ivy League law school and now uh, has her own, uh, uh, it's called the Community Justice Proce uh, Project. Mm -hmm of which I'm very proud of her, and I'll say this, it was her group that went to Geneva 
and testified in front of the United Nations, and they got the state of Florida declared a human rights abusing state for some of the Good laws, the anti-rioting law and things of that nature. Good for them. And so I'm real proud of her. My son, on the other hand, uh, is a comedian in California. And philosophy prepares you. <laughs> he did, it did. He, he was a double major, philosophy and religious studies. Well, yeah. when I was uh, 17, I went to work at a newspaper here. And this may be the reason I'm on the Mob Museum <laughs> board and got into history. Uh, the newspaper was the one here that actually covered the mob. The stories you see now about organized crime in Las Vegas were in that paper. And our publisher was indicted for helping the mob skim money <laughs> while he was publishing the stories that brought down the mob, which, which tells you something about journalism, though I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> and the paper went bankrupt, and I was a history major and decided to stay with that. But I'd entered college as a communications major because I was going to be a journalist, yet here I was working at it. And I thought, well, that doesn't make much sense. I, I can do something else. And I'm asking people for advice on what to major in. I wanted to major in history. And my high school government teacher, who also taught history, and was the reason I got to work at the newspaper, uh, he said, major in computer science, it's the future. Okay. The publisher of the paper, who I like to call a lovable Tory, he was very conservative politically. He said, why don't you major in philosophy? And I said, why would I major in philosophy? And he said, because college is the last time you get to study something totally useless. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> not true, <laughs> of course. But it, it's a valuable commentary. A man who you would think with his politics, and I'm not criticizing anybody when I say it, would say, you're going to college, you're going to do this and this, and concentrate just on this. And okay, you, you can come out with a philosophy degree and go on and do other things. As a matter of fact, I think that, especially today, where people change jobs every 10 years, mm -hmm. the more liberal base you have in your education, the better prepared you are to go on. Because one of the things is you could teach somebody a business, but you can't teach them how to think. No. and. There, there is an old line that uh, Ben Bradley, who edited the Washington Post, had, where he said he did not want a journalism major unless it was the one who edited the school paper. Because he said that person revealed a depth of commitment. But he said, give me a science major because we need to cover science. We can teach you how to write. I love it. Or, or a history major who we can use in that way. So I, I'm fascinated by the mob museum. And my wife, by the way, I dragged her there, and she wants to go back every weekend. If you have not been to the Mob Museum, it is a truly great museum. It really, really is. And it's displays, and it's flow, and everything like that. But in talking about that, my family came out to Las Vegas in 1966. My uncle was the head of security at Momonte and Lucky Luciano's bodyguard. <laughs> now, let me tell you how corrupt Cuba was. The mob came in, and they cleaned up the casino. That's how corrupt Cuba was. They skimmed off the top, but the, it, and it was interesting here for Hispanic Heritage Month, I saw this uh, piece, a PSA on television, celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, celebrating the fall of Cuba because it brought all the dealers, uh -huh. dancers yep. to Vegas and, and cemented Vegas as being the gambling capital of the world. And I'm going, no, no, you're not supposed to celebrate a communist takeover. That's wrong. But that's what, I, at one point, Vegas had more Cubans in Miami. No, there was a large Cuban community. Here there still is. is. And I remember the Review Journal was doing a series called The First 100. And it became a marvelous book, 100 short biographies of important people in the history of Las Vegas. And they were discussing, well, what role have Latinos and Latinas played here? And I said, well, frankly, the history is very early than a much minimized role and then more recently. And it was harder to work in what had happened recently. And they said, well, uh, do you think there's someone we can include? I said, I can name someone who affected our defense industry by building up Nellis Air Force Base on the test side and helped the gaming industry by building up the personnel there. They said, who? I said, Fidel Castro. <laughs> uh, they said, we don't think we're going to do that. And I, I agree. I, I got in my joke. But it's true. And in fact, I had a high school Spanish teacher who had been a university president in Cuba and had to leave. And when, but when you talk about the mob cleaning up casinos, it's funny because the odds tell you the house is going to win. 
there are several people who've been credited with the quote, if you want to make money in a casino, own it. That's the best way. And they don't need to have crooked games to win. And the mob understood that. that. They actually approached it that way here for the most part. Bad apple in every barrel and all that. But I appreciate what you say about the mob museum. And I, I help with the research and I, I go in and I make comments. And there's also a uh, display case about the police in New York City featuring my grandfather, uh, who we nicknamed Sticky Fingers. Uh, <laughs> whenever someone says, is there police corruption? I said, I, I am the grandson of police corruption. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's an interesting story of how we got the museum and the purpose and all of that because we have a reputation for implosions. And the federal government had built this building in 33 and was going to get rid of it because the, they didn't need it anymore. It's a beautiful building. I know. And the mayor was Oscar Goodman, who'd been a mob lawyer. And Oscar being Oscar, he said, look, you can't get rid of that building. I tried my first case there. I threw up on those steps. <laughs> uh, so they said, well, if you make it a cultural center, you can have it for a dollar, basically. And, okay, what are we going to put in there? Cultural, that's history, okay. And they wound up with that. Well, the head of the FBI here, Ellen Knowlton, was retiring. And Oscar went to made a presentation, and he said, I have a job for you. And she became the head of the nonprofit. And suddenly the FBI said, wow, th they mean it. She's involved. We trust her. We don't trust Oscar. We fought him. <laughs> and Oscar would tell you that. And it helped us get access to things. And then as time went on, finding things around the country and getting various talent involved, uh, it's been a wonderful experience. I'm on the board and I'm involved with the content committee. So I, I get to play a little role and uh, it's very gratifying. So what can you tell me, since the book is not published yet, on organized crime in North America? Uh, first of all, Las Vegas is a good central location to concentrate on, but, and this is one way to look at it, we, we have a display at the museum where we have a bunch of cities and you just press the button and, right. oh, San Francisco had a mob. San Francisco? Really? Yeah, it's everywhere. Tampa had a mob. Tampa did, and uh, in fact, trivia, Estes Kefauver, and this is the way we justified the mob museum, Estes Kefauver had his committee investigating right. organized crime and came here and held a hearing in the courtroom. At the time, the population was about 25,000. He went to 14 cities. Las Vegas was the smallest city by far. The next smallest city was Tampa. Ah. So they hit Florida. I'm sure they hit the beaches too you know, yes. while they're there. Uh, Meyer but, Lansky? You know, why not? But you know, again, you, you've got this all over the country in some form or another. There's always some illegal activity. I was telling the story that when during my residency, I was at the public hospital, mm -hmm. and we had a Ward D, which was for the prisoners. And it was during the Orange Bowl. Mm -hmm. Penn State was playing, and I get called to go see Joe Paterno. And I'm saying, they arrested the head coach? <laughs> it was the mob guy from Tampa, Joe Paterno, <laughs> <laughs> that they had in prison there. I said, oh, thank God. The other one was that was really interesting. A dear friend of mine who was a hematologist who was an old, old Miami family, what they used to call the Gladesmen, mm -hmm. where they used to live in the Everglades, that the family considered the fact that he became a physician that he was lazy. <laughs> ah. And so it was his first cousin that I was visiting in prison for gator poaching and running cocaine. I said, oh, those two go together? I didn't know that. <laughs> you might find somebody arrested for one of those. Here. Exactly, but in South Florida, Not much you get them for both. Here. Well, uh, apropos of uh, Joe Paterno, I had a best friend, uh, his last name is Augusta. Well, we had a mobster here named Joe Augusto. Uh -huh. And people kept calling his house and saying, hey, is Joe there? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And finally, one day his father had had enough who were kids. His father said, no, what's it to you? <laughs> and they never got another call. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Besides requiring more history mm -hmm. as an undergraduate, and with all the things we have to teach mm -hmm. in medical school, and that's why we, I always recommend read everything you can before medical school, because for those four years, I'm going to give you enough to read, yeah. is it becomes important that they have the historical perspective in medical school but since we're going to be in the communities and our students are going to be in the households in these communities, it becomes even more important that they learn history. So I, 
I know that you're going to be uh, lecturing at our medical school, or I hope you will. I hope to. And be able to give the perspective, because you are, uh, uh, apart from being brilliant and this great writer, you are, you also... <laughs> Who? <laughs> are, you're, you're, you're such a great teacher. Well, I appreciate that. And, and I mean, every time I've seen you on television, I learned. When I had lunch with you, I learned. But I mean, it was just, it, 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 it's an experience that everybody should be having. You are such a gift to this community well, and this country. I, I appreciate that. And, and a little story, if I may. Yes. I won a national teaching award in my profession. Very now, cool. I claim nobody else applied that year or whatever, <laughs> but what inspired it was that the previous institution where I taught, there, there were faculty outside of the liberal arts who said, why don't we get rid of the humanities requirement? Oh. And I got mad and we were able to defeat it, but I thought, how do I get this across? And I, this is something I suggest. I started having students do an autobiography. Mm. And then having read the autobiography, and this is what got me this award, I have no doubt, I would say, oh, you want to be a cardiologist. Uh, why don't you look into the history of cardiology as a research project in this class? So they're getting the history, generally, but they're also learning something that excites them. And one of the problems we run into is that we sometimes think of what excites us instead of what excites them. That's true. That is so true. And it's, it's interesting as you say that because if you go to UNLV, you'll get the full professor teaching you. Mm -hmm. If you go to one of our legacy schools, you'll get a teacher's assistant. You know, uh, and I mentioned Columbia. Uh, they hired a major prize winner and said, by the way, you're teaching undergrads. They, they pride themselves on that. And he said, oh, I don't teach undergrads. They said, then we're not hiring you. And he, he settled down and he, he, he said, I'll teach you. Yeah. And, and I mean, part of this is UNLV is a research one school and it's a very good school, but undergraduates far outnumber the graduate students. And that's where most of the students are. And you, you have to meet those students. And we in our department require people to teach surveys. Perfect. And, you know, the, the other thing is it helps us. It's kind of like if you are, I'll say, a neurologist. Yeah, you need to be up on your field, but it helps to have some of the general in there too, because other things yeah, of all are the other things that could occur. Well, I think we're out of time, and this is Cuban time, so we can go on forever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> UNLV, all your students, and actually everybody that watches uh, uh, Professor Green on PBS or anything else he's on is going to learn and be richer for it. I thank you, and I know Las Vegas thanks you, and I gotta tell you, this country thanks you oh. for what you're doing with history. It's, for those, what is the old saying? For those that don't remember history are damned to repeat it. And it becomes important yeah. to do that. And also, a person that is as brilliant as he is and as accomplished, to have his personality that comes out and it's, treats everybody with kindness is a lesson we all need to learn. So from Studio A in Las Vegas, let's be kind to one another. Let's make this a better world. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe, like, and comment on your favorite podcast platform. If you'd like to support the groundbreaking work that Dr. Greer is doing at the Roseman University College of Medicine, please donate at the link below. Thanks for tuning in to No Laughing Matter with Cuba Pete, as together we work to unite the heart and science of healthcare to serve all in our communities. See you next time.